So now I'm going to give my second of six lectures on intermediate macroeconomics. I'm going to give a model that determines wages and employment levels using labor supply and labor demand. It looks like regular supply and demand with the upward sloping supply curve and the downward sloping demand curve. We can kind of tie it together with basic supply and demand from principles classes, but I'm going to show where exactly the curves come from, and then I'll talk about how shifts in each curve can determine wages and employment. Right. So we're going to determine W and N, wages and the employment level, of the four main macro variables. N is one of them. Well, the wages is important, too, and, and people in business and economics talk about wage growth a lot. But um, more important, a little bit for the, the core model, is the employment level. All right, so the first curve is labor demand, ND. Again, I'd call labor N. It's based on MPN, which is the marginal productivity of labor. So it's the, in, it's the output given by one more input of labor. If you add a worker, how much additional output do you get? All right, and because of diminishing marginal returns, as labor increases, marginal productivity of labor falls. And you might have seen that in a principles class. Adding workers to a factory floor, for example, eventually capital is limited. You run out of machines, and those uh, workers are not as productive and so productivity will fall. Now, you might not have seen marginal revenue product of labor, and so MRPN is simply MPN determined in dollars, and so uh, it's price times MPN. So for example, if you have an auto worker who makes two cars a day, and the cars are worth $40,000, you could say the worker made $80,000 worth of output. Uh, remember that split across the machinery and the, the other input, so the worker doesn't take every penny of that home, but the worker does produce, and the worker should get paid what they're produced. And, and because of that, to say if you make one automobile and, and it's worth $40,000, you make $40,000 worth of production. It's simply your production or the worker's production times the price put into dollar terms. It's not going to be very different looking from MPN, but it is, it's pressed in dollars as our wages, and so it's going to put it all in dollars. Labor supply, I don't show the micro behind it. Again, a lot of, um, a lot of this might be based on a microeconomic model, um, but I'll talk about how it's based on substitution. And the big thing is the labor-leisure trade-off. And so if you pay people more, they will forego leisure. They'll work more hours because you're paying them more. Okay, And they're substituting labor for leisure. And that's true for anything in economics. If you change the price, people will buy it more or less compared to the other things they could do with their money. Here, people have a limited amount of time. So they're going to, you know, you have 24 hours in a day, you can't work all 24, but if someone pays you more, you're going to work more and have less leisure because of that high pay. Now, some people say, well, if people paid you enough, you would work very little, um, but we're going to assume that substitution works now. And so we're not going to assume that people work less if you pay them more. We're going to assume people pay, work more if you pay them more. Right. So I made these graphs in R. I've got N for my labor inputs from 0 to 6. I've got my output. Zero workers produce zero units of output. This is simply the difference as I add a worker. So the first zero workers produce zero. The first worker produces 10. Second produces 8. And notice it's less, right? 10, 18 minus 10 is 8. And because of diminishing returns, MPN is continually falling. Right. So this is graph. This is the production function. This is inputs and outputs. So output is a function of input, right? The more input I put in, the more output I get, but it's not a straight line. It tapers off because of diminishing returns. And again, that's because of something else that is scarce. Workers expand, but capital might not be able to expand, for example. So again, limited machinery on a factory floor, uh, limited uh, energy inputs, limited space, things like that. And if I graph MPN, you can see that it's falling, and this graph is a downward sloping curve, and that looks exactly like a demand curve. In fact, uh, the MPN is the demand curve, or the MRPN is the demand curve. All right, it's the same idea, diminishing returns, diminishing benefits. So I talk a lot about the demand curve as the benefits to the consumer or whoever. Here, the, the MPN is the producer's, excuse me, if the worker produces, that's the benefit to their employer. Okay, so here, the more workers you have, the less they produce. And so, you, so eventually, they're going to produce less than you pay them, and they're not worth hiring. Right? So I've got a production function here. I put in some realistic numbers. If you're familiar with the Cobb-Douglas production function, this is well known in economics, but if you haven't seen it, Y is a function of capital and labor. These are the parameters here. I've got them adding up to 1, so it's constant returns. Um, and so beta is 0.3, alpha, the share for labor is 0.7. The technological parameter A, or total factor productivity, is A. I just put 2. Right. And I'm assuming this is fixed at 1,000 units of capital. Right. So here I'm adding more and more workers, but capital is fixed. And so diminishing returns is going to kick in. And here it doesn't you know, have the traditional curve like you might see if it's drawn, but it does sort of taper. 
down like this. And then the MPN based on that does have this downward portion to it. Okay, so that's what it would look like with real numbers. Okay, so I'm increasing N up to 100, right, with K fixed as 1,000, and these numbers are fixed as well. Okay, now if I put a price of $4, which again I just sort of made up, you can look, these curves look exactly the same. The only thing is that these numbers, you start with 9, here you got 36. Everything is multiplied by 4. The shape doesn't change. It's the same shape. Uh, the only thing that changes are the numbers. Right? So this is measured in dollars, just like wages are. Right? People don't get paid in cars. People don't get paid in coffee. They get paid in dollars. And so here we're putting uh, the pr productivity in dollars, and we're putting the wage in dollars. And according to economics, if, you're if you produce less than you're paid, you won't get hired. If you produce more than you're paid, you can move on or, or through competitive forces. We hope you can get a raise or you can find somebody who pays you what you're worth. In economics, productivity and wages should be equal. All right? Uh, so here's the MRPN curve. Right? So this is dollar value production by each additional workers. We can see the first workers are more productive, the last workers are less productive. All right? Now here, I made an arbitrary $15 wage. All right? We could go back to the curve, but we can see that here, it would line up at N, number of workers at 37 workers, right about at 37. In other words, over here, workers are so productive they should get paid more, right? but over here, workers are less productive. They're not actually producing $15 worth of a production, and so there's no economic incentive to hire them. All right, so the optimal labor force is exactly 37 workers, no more, right? Because those the 38th worker isn't worth their pay. Um, if you have 36 workers, you're actually giving up a worker who's making you some money, right? So right here is the optimal labor force. We're determining N in the labor market. So we've got one of those four variables. W is fixed, right? So I just gave you 15, uh, but we're determining the labor force. And so this is one way to, to talk about you know how wages determine the, the optimal labor force. Now let's change the wage. We're going to raise the wage from 15 to 20. So I'm going to raise it up to 20 and look at the crossing point here. Now these workers who were profitable at $15 are no longer profitable. Right? So they're making $19 worth of work. It's profitable if you pay them 15 but it's not profitable, profitable if you pay them 20 Right, so right here, you can see that this crossing point has moved to the left. And so if you raise the wage from 15 to 20, you'll see that the, the labor force fell from 37 to 14. All right, so raising the wage lowers labor demand. Okay, But that's with only one variable. It's only for labor force. This is only labor demand, and it's a given price. But in the NSND model, it has labor supply as well as labor demand. So this is going to determine wage rate and the employment level simultaneously. Now this looks exactly like a supply and demand model you've seen a million times if you've taken economics before. It's going to, you have the price, right here's the price of labor, it's the wage, and you have the quantity, this is the quantity of labor. So instead of P and Q, it's the price of labor and the quantity of labor. It's really no different if you look at it that way. Right? But what's different in terms of what we just did is that this is an upward sloping curve. Now, I'm not going to get into the micro of it, but you could have isoquants, you could have the labor leisure trade off. That's more of an intermediate microeconomic thing. But I'm just going to talk about the idea that people substitute labor for leisure. If you raise the wage, people will work more because the opportunity cost of labor is being paid for. So, for example, if uh, you, you were going to sleep, you say, well, I can sleep tomorrow, I'm going to work because I'm getting paid, it's worth the lost sleep, maybe you have to pay for child care, you say, well, I'm making enough money, if you pay me enough, I can pay for child care, and it's still worth it. So there's a lot of reasons why high wages will get labor, and people to, to work more. All right. So again, that's where the upward, upward sloping supply curve comes from. Downward comes from marginal productivity of labor, upward comes from the labor leisure trade-off. Okay, now what about if we shift them? So we're going to move one or both of the curves. Remember, you can move them two directions, right? So supply can go right, more supply or less supply, you can go left, or you can have more demand and less demand. Right? Now, textbook stuff, um, the big things for demand are capital stock. That was given the letter A in the production function. Like sometimes it's called technology or, or some sort of total factor productivity. But if you increase production, that uh, the productivity, um, th that means that there will actually be more demand for workers because productivity is higher, right? So you can, if you can produce more, you need workers to do it. Same thing with capital. If, if there's more machines, you're going to need more capital to do it. Now that's for more, you'd go to the right. So more capital means more workers demanded, and they would actually get paid more because you cross up here. Same, but if you go the opposite direction, the same thing can happen, right? Less capital, or a lot of times people talk about a decrease in technology. Same thing, you can go to the, the left as well, which means 
fewer workers needed for fewer machines and you pay them less because you don't demand them as much all right and if there's less technology for whatever reason you would have less pay, uh, pay as well all right now labor supply when people talk about um, wealth right so sometimes if people have more wealth they will work less all right, so you can have demand shift left, or if there's some sort of decrease in wealth, like in 2008, a lot of people uh, lost their retirement savings, their 401ks crashed. So after the 2008 crisis, a lot of people had to return to work, and there was more labor supply. Okay, uh, population can increase, more labor supply, or decrease. And then another thing is labor force participation, which is the percentage of available workers who could work, or p potentially, you know, uh, various ages, you know, people are in working age, or people in the household, people start to work who were not working before, but usually about, you know, maybe 60%, give or take, are working, if that goes up to 62, or down to 55, or something like that, m a higher or lower percentage of people who are working as opposed to not working, okay? So again, two curves, two directions can give, uh, different, uh, the, the end result is to give changes to N, right, the, what happens to employment, but you can also see what happens to wages, right? So here's the capital stock increase, right? So increase in the capital stock means more labor demand, right? There's more machines, more workers are needed to work those machines, right? The same thing could be said for computers or cash registers or, or whatever you want to talk about, but more equipment requires more workers, which means more labor demand, and we can see here that there's more workers, right? Equilibrium labor force went up, and then because uh, there's more machines and more workers are needed, there's more demand, the pay, the wage to workers goes up, all right? So more capital will actually mean higher paid workers and more workers working, okay? Going back, you can also do this one from our starting point. Here is population increase. A lot of times people talk about uh, some countries have uh, immigration growing their population more than natural increase. Other times people, uh, some countries don't have much immigration, but they also have low birth rates. Things like that people talk about what are the effects of uh, increases in population. So more workers means more supply, means higher equilibrium labor force, but also there can be a, a downward pressure on wages, right? So we talked about capital stock increasing or population increasing. Obviously you can go two directions, can play around with it, um, but you can talk about, uh, you know, which curve moves which direction. But these are kind of the big ones for labor demand and then also the big ones for labor supply. Right. So that's what our model did, right? Laid out equilibrium wages and pop, um, labor force, right? Which is the not the entire population, but just the people who are working. You can show what happens to supply and demand, and then it has effects on wages and on the labor force, right? So this this I don't use in, in my system of models, right? Because I kind of talk about the. Pr I actually go back to the production function, and I say, well, if GDP goes up because population goes up, I kind of draw a positive relationship using the production function. But you can work this in and you can talk about what happens in the economy um, because of these factors. And so population, uh, excuse me, employment rate is one of the biggest ones, right? But a lot of times people do talk about what happens to wages. And so if wages are going up, that's good for workers, it's good politically, it's good for families. And so you can talk about what the various factors are that shifts labor supply and labor demand that can lead to wages and employment.